I want to welcome everybody to today's event, our first webinar of 2016, presenting end of year data results, hacks with tables and charts. And I think that's perfect because we're all working on budgets and presenting end of year results. And Taylor is a whiz at this stuff. I know that I've been lucky enough in the dry run to have learned a couple of facts I didn't even know about how to create charts. And I'm always looking forward to hearing what he has to say. As I said, my name is Sharon Fitzpatrick, and many of you may know me as the webinar chick. I've been doing the webinars for a long time for Presentation Expert, and I'm really excited to now add the title of editor to my title and to what my job responsibilities are. So I'm really excited to start bringing you some great content, and I always love to hear from you. So if you do webinars at presentationexpert.com or editor at presentationexpert.com, I will certainly get that information. Feel free to tweet with us today, hashtag presentation expert. You can find us in multiple places on social media, and we always want to keep the conversation going. It is my great pleasure to introduce Taylor. I have really been lucky to have gotten to meet him and know him in person. I'm amazed about what he knows and how he can create shortcuts that are just amazing. I've sat in many of his classes. I always come out with a multiple pages of notes as to anything that I can find out. And I'm really excited that he's going to be the first one joining us today. So at this time, I'm going to turn over control to him and say we are excited to hear what you have to say, Taylor. Awesome. Well, I am thrilled to be here. And let me just share my screen. So I'll start this in actually presentation mode. i um, going to hit Shift F5 for all you sh shortcut gurus. And as we go through this, I am going to pop in and out of normal view and presentation view because I actually want to demo a bunch of this stuff because I think that's where the real value add comes in. And if we just get started, okay, I've, I've tried to jam pack this webinar with tips, tricks, hacks, and all that kind of good stuff. And I just want to point out, though, this is really for the slide builders out there. So. I want to get into the nitty gritty stuff, moving things around, how to pull off some impossible things or things that are technically impossible in PowerPoint. So this isn't going to be just general presentation advice. Um, I always like to dive down to that nitty gritty stuff. And what I like to think about, especially as a slide builder, having built lots of slides, is we're always looking to get rid of rats. And I'll go through this slowly so that I know we, we're broadcasting online. So it's Sometimes the slides take a minute. And so what's a rat? A rat is what I call a repetitive, annoying task. And most of our lives, at least my life, working in Excel, Word, PowerPoint, all that kind of stuff, is if you, if it's just inundated with these repetitive things. that annoying. So, you know, play into Word, Excel, you know, Outlook. We're going to be focused entirely here on PowerPoint today. But, you know, this also um, goes over if there's any Photoshop experts on the call today or there's any Gmail users. There are shortcuts, hacks, tips, tricks all over the place. And if you can really start to implement those, you'll find that you can start to take these 20, 40, 50-minute tasks and consolidate them down to two minutes or less. And I'm sure everybody on the call has had at least one time the experience where you saw a colleague doing something and you thought, why on earth are you doing it like that? How come you don't do it like this, right? And they're doing the long roundabout way to get something done, and they just didn't know it. So, you know, kind of above and beyond the hacks, tips, and tricks, I really hope that what we cover today, a little bit of the philosophy and the theory behind this, really helps to inspire you to think differently, all right? Because that's where you're going to get these big breakthroughs in your productivity so you can spend your time on higher priority tasks. And that's what we often talk about at the end of our videos and our trainings about getting you to happy hour. So build better slides faster from PowerPoint or build better models faster, et cetera. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about speed. So I'm not looking at shortcutting the quality of the work. I'm just, how do we build a better slide faster? Uh, Sharon already got a mug shot. That's my mug shot. What did I look like? I started my career in PricewaterhouseCoopers. I lived in China for 10 years and I was working with an investment bank doing inbound, outbound transactions. So I lived in that PowerPoint Excel. These were my two programs I I built all slides and models so this is all coming from the trenches because I did the same thing and taking some even though we were talking about pictures I feel like this is a must um, a topic that just needs to be addressed more so what is the 
And this is going to sound super boring. You've probably heard this before. But the ultimate hack is the QAT in your keyboard. I think there we go. Now the slide came through. So this sounds boring. You've probably already heard it. But I would willing to bet that it's probably the most important thing that you either aren't using or if you are using it, you probably aren't using it enough. So I want to quickly go through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We have more information about this in the handouts and links to resources if, if you don't even know what the QAT is. But let's just start out with a quick poll. Everyone's juice is going uh, to participate. And the question I'm going to ask, just hold on a second before we do any voting, is do you have a default QAT? So what is a default QAT? And if I go to the next slide, wait till this comes through. Well, you know what? We don't need to because most people have already showed us what it is. And basically, we've got 74% say no and 23% say yes. And we okay. now have 6% who said I'm not telling. <laughs> okay, well, good. So it sounds like people have already been through a bunch of QAT stuff. That's awesome. I want to, on top of that, kind of share what I think is the million dollar shortcut. So we will just see if, um, I will show you what I think is kind of the million dollar shortcut for PowerPoint that, you know, if you take nothing else away from this webinar, um, if you set this up, and I think Sharon, you said you set it up after our, the presentation summit thing, I mean, this will save you a ton of time. So let me just flip to this slide. I'm going to go back normal view, make sure you guys can see this, and I just have a slide that's kind of all across the board at the moment. I'm just going to demo kind of what this would look like, so once you have this set up, I'm going to set it up, you can select things, you can hit Alt, 1, T for top, things will go to the top, you can align the slides, so you can horizontally distribute things, all right, you can Alt, 1, B for bottom, you can move things to the left, you can move things to the center, move things to the middle. You know, all this kind of good stuff that a lot of people will spend a lot of their time doing manually. All right? Hopefully that came through. I, mean, I tried to whip through it. Um, did that come through, Sharon? I, I, think think, slide... I think it did come through. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to add it to the question area. We do have a question, though. One thing people want to know is what font are you using? And, yeah. um, the font is Kessel. 205, K-E-S-S-E-L 205. It's a font we bought online. And people thought you did it so fast they weren't sure what keyboard keys you were using. So can you that's, go over that's the point. So I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna show you how to set it up. The point was it was supposed to be fast. That's why I hustled. <laughs> so what you're gonna do, um, I'm gonna remove this from my QAT. So what I want everybody to do, I guarantee this is the best QAT shortcut you can put. You want to go find your QAT. So just hit and let go of the Alt key. If you have PowerPoint all fired up, you should somewhere either above or below your ribbon see a sequence of numbers, right? So that's your QAT. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so that's what we're going to kind of speed shortcut. And the number one thing I want you to put on there is I want you to go to the Home tab, all right? I want you to go to the Arrange tool. Open up that Arrange Tool drop-down. I'll go slowly. I realize this is streaming online. I want you to right-click the Alignment Tool. Make sure you click it. You right-click it at this group level and not the individual commands. I want you to right-click the Alignment Tool. It'll say Add to Quick Access Toolbar. Just select Add to Quick Access Toolbar. It's going to get thrown up there. I'm going to move slowly. You want to go back to your QAT, and at the very end of it, there should be a downward-facing arrow. All right, just bear with me here, even if this doesn't make a lot of sense at the moment. Click the downward facing arrow. You want to come to us, the bottom of command says more commands. I'm going to select more commands. You're going to pop open a dialog box. There's a ton of different options here. We're not going to talk about any of them. All you're going to go do is on the far right, you're going to go find that align objects shortcut. It should be on your right. You're going to select it. And you're just going to click the upward arrow and walk it all the way to the top. I don't care what you have on your QAT. You can take this away later if you don't think this is the million-dollar shortcut. Click it all the way to the top and click OK. All right? Now, what's that, what's that, what that's done, and I'm just going to grab something on my slide and get it out of position. So if I move it over here to the left, I'll move it up left. If I now select another object, so I have two objects selected, you're going to hit and let go of the Alt key once. 
All right, you're going to get all these numbers are going to pop up. That alignment tool should have the number one on it. It's the easiest shortcut to hit. You're going to hit one on your keyboard. It's going to pop open all your alignment options. Notice you get a bunch of other um, keystroke commands. These are all keyboard driven. And if I hit R for right alignment, my object is going to immediately pop into right alignment. All right, if same concept. If I then select another object and I align B to bottom, so I'm going to hit, hit and let go of the Alt key once. I'm going to hit and let go of the one key, it's going to pop back open, and I'm going to hit B for bottom, and that's going to snap into position. All right, if you're working in PowerPoint, building lots of pitches, proposals, company overviews, financials, if you're moving objects around all day long, that shortcut can save you hundreds of hours if you actually let it, and it's so easy because it's just an alt one keystroke. So that's the million dollar shortcut uh, that I am trying to get everybody to use. Um, it doesn't require any add-ins, you don't have to buy any software, it's all set up, you just have to put a little strategy into it. And just going forward before we get into these hacks and tricks, I want to give you a couple other, well first off, is there a question about that, did anyone not get that to work right? If you look uh -huh. in the handout, I think it's step by step in the handout as well, if it's not, we, we can add it. It's there, we have somebody saying the category 3 box is not aligned with the box underneath. Yes, so that one you just alt one R for right alignment and you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Shaboom. All right, so let me just give you, before we get into the charts and tables, so if I just go back to full screen, so three rules to master the QAT. Um, you probably heard, you know, you should put stuff on your QAT, but what do you put on your QAT? Very first rule, you want to save that QAT for commands that do not already have a keyboard shortcut. All right, I see a lot of people using their QAT and they've got bold up there, they've got copy, they've got undo, they've got redo. Those all have, you know, control C for copy, control Y for redo, control B for bold, control I for I. Like, those are quick keyboard shortcuts that I don't think is any advantage to going up on your QAT. So I would advise you don't put anything that already has a keystroke to it up on your QAT. The second rule, which is what we just did, you want to save the QAT for commands that have more than four or five keystrokes into the ribbon or ribbon guides. I call them ribbon guides. Okay, and now what's that mean? Let me just go back to the normal view here. All right, if I select something and I was going to do this normally, I'm just going to move this away from the slide. If I was normally going to align something without the QAT, I'm just using my ribbon guides, it would look like this. You'd hit and let go of the alt key so that it's one keystroke. You hit the H key on your keyboard to go to the home tab, that's two, hit G for arrange, three, A for alignment, four, and then you would have to hit, you know, T for top. And that does work, but having to go Alt H G A L for left, you know, it's just you're it's just it's too many keystrokes. That's the kind of command I would put up on the QAT. So just like the alignment tool that we just put there, the million dollar shortcut, save that space for um, commands that don't have a shortcut and are more than four or five ribbon guides deep. And if you want to take it up one more level, this is when you're really starting to think about strategy, start to think about the order that you put the QAT in. So I like to organize mine and all my training sessions and stuff into two broad categories. I have what I call the keyboard section. So this is typically um, font, formatting, alignment, send front, send back, type of stuff, so things that you do repetitively over and over again, and remember we're talking about rats here, repetitive annoying tasks, so those are good things to have there. The second side, especially for PowerPoint, is what I call the mouse section, and this is what you want to save for like charts, shapes, text boxes, rectangles, inserting tables, whatever you're inserting that once you hit it, you still have to draw it on your slide with your um, mouse. So there's really no advantage to hitting these commands with a keyboard shortcut because you still have to go grab your mouse, which is an entirely different conversation, the keyboard versus your mouse, when to use which, and like how to move entirely onto your keyboard, which is the more you can move onto your keyboard for all these programs, the faster you are going to become. All right? So those are my three rules for mastering the QAT. Again, download the handout if you want a bunch more verbiage on that. I was trying to keep this section short, but I do think that is the ultimate hack. And before we move on, are there any questions about that? Did we get any, Sharon? I'm going to drink some coffee. Okay, so it doesn't sound like we have any questions. So let's continue on, and let's start talking about PowerPoint charts. And I think the next slide, there we go. I think the next slide is we're going to do a poll. And so my poll for you is, 
you know, how do you do your charts in PowerPoint? Everyone said that they're doing lots of financial data and stuff. Are you embedding or linking from Excel? Are you pasting as a picture or are you building natively in PowerPoint? How, how do you do your charts in PowerPoint? Are you embedded and linking? Are you building them in PowerPoint or are you pasting as a picture? I'm just curious. I'm always curious about this topic. So most people are working in Excel and PowerPoint, so this is a good one. Let's see what the poll results are. Well, that looks pretty even. So some people, it looks like, looks like 30, 30, 30. Interesting, very interesting. So I want to quickly address the pasting as a picture. So let's, let's go for it. I'm a strong proponent of building your charts natively in PowerPoint. And just I want to quickly address the picture one because I know a lot of people do this. So I just want to quickly show what can happen when you're building your charts um, or pasting your charts in as pictures. This starts to get into a concept of when you build your slides that I call respecting both ends of the deck. So which, which means that as you build your slides, you always want to think about how can I make this easier for myself in the future? Or how can I make this easier for my colleague in the future? All right, so if you can build your slides in such a way that they're easy to update in the future, you can start to really crunch through um, your own decks and other people's decks. So on screen I have, I'm just gonna hold the control key and click with my mouse, that's your laser pointer if you've never done that. So this chart on the left is a native PowerPoint chart, which is how I recommend building them. Here on the right is the paste as picture option, which I know is very popular. And I just want you to notice right now, if you just look at the numbers here on the left, like this 1.1 is sharp and clear, this 1.8 right next to it in the other chart is still kind of hazy fuzzy. So your charts pasted as pictures right off the bat, even if you paste them as the same size, are not gonna come through as sharp and clean as a native PowerPoint chart. On top of that, getting back to uh, respecting both ends of the decks, if I hit escape and I come in here, if I was updating this, watch what happens as I start to update these charts, right? So I'm gonna click in. Maybe we're gonna take this as a dashboard out to four charts, so I'll just copy them down. And I will try to move slowly. I will hit Shift F5 to go back to full screen. Waiting for it to buffer back to full screen. So very quickly, I, I whipped through this. Now, right off the bat, the, these charts on the left, these numbers are now too big for the charts. Um, I'll show you a shortcut to do that really quick. But notice the other chart. So this is your picture pasted as a picture chart. Look how you just lose so much of the, the clearness of the chart. And the problem is if I now hit escape to come back and I see these numbers on my charts here on the right side of my slide are too small, I can't do anything with them. I click them, it's just a picture. I basically have to go back into Excel. I need to update the model. I need to copy it, you know, alt tab back to PowerPoint, control V, paste this picture, all that jazz. Where my picture is here on the left, right? If you just select a chart, you can hit the control shift left caret key to walk your text size down. This will very quickly, uh, if I just hit shift F5 again, something very quickly and easy that you can edit. All right, does that make sense? Hopefully. I think it makes sense, and hopefully, Taylor, I've had some audio challenges, but hopefully we are back, and you can hear me okay. Yep, we, I can hear you clear. So that's that's just pasting as a picture. Now, embedding, linking, if you know what you're doing, you don't have any issues with that, like I'm not going to tell you to not do that. I just typically would always recommend building your charts natively in PowerPoint. Linking, you have this whole file sharing issue, which we can't get into. And embedding, it just remember that when you embed a chart in PowerPoint, it does bring over the full Excel file including any hidden sheets or tabs in that Excel file. So just be careful when you embed a chart that you go through that Excel file and, and scrub out your confidential information. I've seen people leak a lot of stuff embedding their charts. So it's if you know what you're doing, awesome. If you don't, I would just build them natively. It's the safest all-around solution. Uh, so that's just kind of my quick little point, charting. Uh, PowerPoint's a charting gold standard, absolutely. This, this, is where I would, this is where I build all my charts. So, so we, we well, Taylor, we have a couple of great questions. So one was, can you quickly tell us what the shortcut was to change the font size? Mm -hmm. um, in PowerPoint, so the, the universal shortcut, this is the one I recommend you memorize. It's control shift left caret is the same as the comma key. So control shift comma will decrease font size. Control shift period or the right caret will increase font size. 
If you're rocking out 2007, 10, or, or 13, you can get away with control back bracket, control forward bracket, but they've removed mm -hmm. that shortcut in 2016. So I recommend um, doing the universal one. So we have uh, two other, one comment and one question. Um, one comment is um, from Rick. When you embed a linked chart, your ability to animate is hampered, correct? Ooh, I, don't, I, I would assume so. Well, I think Rick is definitely saying it is hampered. So um, okay, we also good. have Elizabeth who wants to know how long does it take to create the native PowerPoint chart if it's already built in another program if it was pasted as a picture? You are going to love the trick we are going to do in just a moment because that is the reason why most people paste these pictures and I'm going to give you a tool to make that not an issue. I, I think this one's my favorite, if I'm not mistaken. I still was in awe of this during our dry run. So. I hope so. It's one of those long. It's like one of those non-hidden features that nobody knows about. It's like not hidden, but it's nobody's using it. So, are there any other questions? I like the question. There was a question that just somebody is saying: if you copy as a picture in Excel and paste normal in PowerPoint, you get a better picture. For those of us who have to paste pictures for discovery reasons. So, I see. So you're pasting your chart as a picture because you don't want someone to be able to edit it is what we're getting at, correct? Yeah, I think, I'm sure, for discovery, if you're going through, we had somebody who maybe handles sales of companies or if you've got any financial reasons for SEC issues, that makes sense. So it's, it's just something to think about. No, that's good. Two points on that. Number one, make sure if you're doing that, I would paste that as a PNG. It's going to take up a little bit more space, but you're not going to lose um, as much quality if you go JPEG. That's a whole other discussion, but just remember, paste PNG. Another solution for that, if you need to lock down your deck, there is no way to lock a presentation so that someone can't edit it. Your best solution is you build your deck natively in PowerPoint. You hit F12, save as, and you save it as a picture slideshow. That will immediately turn your entire deck into a new PowerPoint presentation with all of your slides saved as these nice big PNG files. You can send that to people and nobody can touch your information. And if you ever need to update it, you have the original that's not made of pictures. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Let's keep going. Cool. So let's... Okay, before we get to that awesome trick I'm going to show you, let's just quickly talk about over-labeling. I call this my belt and suspenders rule. This is pretty simple, not super complicated. Um, this is my, on my screen, I built this big chart so hopefully everybody can see it. This is what I call belt and suspenders, vertical access and data labels. And the rule is, you can take this if you like, you only need one of them. Either use the vertical access to label your columns or use your data labels. You don't need a belt and suspenders to hold your pants up. And let me just flip through what this would look like. So if I remove the data labels, I go to the next slide. This is what that same chart would look like with the vertical axis. I'm going to wait. It's not come. There we go. So that's what the slide would look like without data labels. This is what this slide would look like with data labels, but without the vertical axis. Wait till it comes through. And the reason for that is you just don't need to label something twice. Now, which one do I prefer? I definitely prefer just using data labels. And the reason why is if I just go back to the other one, this drives me personally crazy, uh, my own personal pet peeve. If you have a chart like this when it's just the vertical axis, even if you have you know nice dashed grid lines and all the thing, if you're looking at you know 2013 over here, you know, you, you're like, okay, well, what is it? And then you have to kind of trace the dotted line back to 18%. So you're like, okay, it's kind of at 18%, and that compares to 2011. And you have to kind of go back and look, and that's just above. You're basically getting neck cramps going back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out what the even just rough approximation of the column is when you can just, if you've built your chart, especially natively in PowerPoint, you just pop on those data labels, you have 100% formatting control, and someone just be like, oh, 2013, 17.7, .7, 2011, 18.6, nobody has to waste time or get neck cramps. That's what I call my belt and suspenders rule. That is a super easy, quick fix if you're doing lots of um, charts in PowerPoint or Excel. Same rule applies to Excel or Word if you're doing that there too. Hopefully that makes sense. That's a pretty simple rule. You might have even heard that before. Let's then now get to, if there's no questions on that, let's get to the power of defaulting your charts. This is the, uh, what we were just talking about a second. And 
The first thing I want to just point out of why this is useful, charts, in my opinion, and I'll tell you why in my opinion, are the most complicated object class. And what I mean by that is just if you take a normal rectangle or text box, a normal rectangle can take five formatting adjustments. You've got you know, your font color, your font size, your shape fill, your shape outline, your shape outline weight, and then so that's five right there. Yes, you can center align, right align, left align, or middle align, bottom line, top align. So you could get up to seven, and then there's a whole slew of things you could do after that, which I wouldn't recommend, but you're, you're overall looking at about five format adjustments, whereas a chart, even just a single series chart, can take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 formatting adjustments, especially as you start to move into multiple series data, and I'll show you this really cool trick using a phantom data series in just a minute, but that's what I mean by the most complicated. You've got axis, you've got the axis, you've got the axis line weight, you've got the axis line color, you've got the shape fills, the shape outlines, you've got the, the data labels, are you using a legend, are you not using a legend, are you using a time, it just goes on and on and on and on, and there's a bajillion options for all that. So that is the reason why I think a lot of people want to embed or link their charts from Excel, it makes perfect sense, I already have my chart over there, why would I spend any more time formatting it, or they go to this pasting this picture um, just because they don't want to reformat it. So that's what I want to talk about. So if I just come back to the normal view, wait till this comes through. On the left, I have a formatted chart. Let's just say that this was the chart that I'm using for my client pitch deck. This is the one I like. This is the one my boss likes, my colleagues like, the client likes, whatever you want to say. And now I'm working on its counterpart, which is currently just a default chart. So again, this chart on the left, I forget, 18, 20, 25 formatting adjustments just to get it look like that. I've just pasted in this chart, I've built it, this is just ugly default colors that come out of Excel. You know, I don't want to go through and make all those formatting adjustments. So what you want to do, it's, a, it's called, a, I call this a five click chart, you've got to set it up first, but it's a five click chart. So what you're going to do is you're going to go find the chart that you want to copy, all. you want to suck all of its formatting out of it, all right? So go find that chart. PowerPoint 2013, 10, I forget, at least 13 and 16, you need to right click. You're going to come find in your right click menu, save as template. If you're rocking 2007 or 2010, I think you come chart tools design tab, and I believe it is on the far left hand corner of your ribbon. You're looking for save as chart template, all right? So I have 2016 here, so I'm going to right click. I'm going to go to the slide. You're going to click save as template which will launch a dialog box. This is a folder where you can save as many chart templates as you like. I've deleted all of mine out just so that it was blank for you. And you're just going to name it. I'm just going to call this a standard stacked column chart gray. Now, as you get into chart templates, you know, this, your naming convention is going to become important because you're going to get confused at some point. So, you know, try to be as specific as possible. If it's for a specific client or a specific company that you're working with, you can, you know, put their initials in front of all the charts so you can see all these chart templates for them right there. So you're just going to click save, and it's going to look like absolutely nothing happened. All right? It looks like I'm no better off than I was. The beauty is if I now come to any other chart in my presentation, if I now right-click it, I'm going to select change chart type, I'm going to navigate up to this often forgot icon at the top of this dialog box. It doesn't look like it's come through yet. There we go. Navigate to the often forgotten template folder at the top. That's where your templates are saved. I'm going to select the template I just saved, 25, 30 format adjustments. I'm going to click OK. And if my computer doesn't wig out, boom. It immediately takes all of that formatting and applies it to the chart. So that's 30 formatting adjustments, just boom. Move to your next chart, as long as it's a double series stacked column chart like this, five clicks, boom, you're done. This is the fastest way that I know of to um, copy and reuse your chart formatting. And the real magic of this, which I think that even people who use some chart templates don't realize, is that this works across the entire Office suite. So if you save a chart template in PowerPoint, you save it in Excel, if you save it in Word, you can reuse that chart template across the entire Office suite. It's saved in that folder. It's there forever. You can save your, you can send your chart templates to your colleagues if you want to make sure that they're using them. And it just, it's just a super fast way to create brand consistency across your investment memorandums, your pitch books, and your, your uh, financial models. 
We once had a new hire when I was working back in banking. We had this big long investment memorandum. I think we had like 30 charts and we had to make like three formatting adjustments to each chart. And he like dove in and was like, I'm going to be here all night. I'm going to do this super hardcore. And he just sat there and started, you know, making three format adjustments to every chart. I was like, you just need a chart template. You're done. Just update your chart template, save it, and just whip through and um, apply it. So. Taylor, I love this one. That really helps solve the rat issue. But I wonder if you could just maybe go over that real quickly again. Because sure. the tips are great and people are trying to write as fast as they can. Oh, yes. Okay, so what you're going to do, you're going to find the chart that you want to save. You, this is what you mean, walk through the steps again, right, Sharon? Yes, exactly. Okay, so you're going to find your chart, and you're going to need to save a chart template for each type of chart you have. So you can't apply a stacked column chart to a pie chart or to a line chart, right? It doesn't make any sense. So you need to save a chart template, so you do have to save a couple of them, but that's small price to pay for efficiency. You're going to right-click the chart if you have PowerPoint 2013-2016. The Save as Chart Templates right there in your right-click menu. If you have 2007 or 2010, I don't know where it is on the Mac either, you select your chart. I forget. I don't have it open right here. You go. It's up in your chart tools special area. It's, I think it's either in the design or the layout tab. It's on the far left. Just click around a little bit. You'll see it eventually. So I'm going to go through it again. You just click Save as Template, which will open up a dialog box. You can see Save as Type. It's a chart template files.crtx file. So you can actually copy and paste these into um, emails or put them on flash drives. Again, naming conventions important, especially as you start to have a bunch of line charts, pie charts, you know, stacked column charts for this situation, stacked column charts for that situation, whatever your formatting stuff is. Valuation ranges work too if you know how to make those, stuff like that. Uh, once you save it, it's there forever. This is a, f a, f uh, a file, a folder, a folder in your Microsoft folder and your templates thing. So this is, you know, goes through all the programs. This is not PowerPoint specific. Once you have it and you want to apply it. Hey, Taylor, this is just really great. And I know people are sharing that this is wonderful. And we have Christine who says that they leverage chart templates for a large group of people to generate charts within the same template. And they send out a deck with all the different chart types. And that's really great because sometimes you're dealing with people who don't have the level of expertise to do this type of thing, charting in PowerPoint. Yeah, for sure. That's that's an awesome. I'm glad she's using that. And that's a great, great use example of sending out a deck with all the pre-formatted charts so that someone can see both what they should look like or could look like and just give people more options. That's a great, great way to do it. So I was just going to say, once you've saved your chart template, again, you're just going to right-click your chart. You're going to go change chart type. All right, this is just your normal change chart type dialog box. You have a templates folder up at the top. Everyone always forgets about this. And that's where all of your chart templates are saved. It's really kind of that simple. Um, and again, the same thing. If you're in Word, if you're in Excel, same process. Right-click, save chart template. Once you have your template, right-click, apply chart template. That's kind of all there is to it. So that is chart templates. How are we doing on time? We're doing awesome. I've just got a couple more tricks. I know there's only supposed to be an hour, and I went way over last time with all the hacks and tricks we did. So let's – another quick one. I see a lot of people um, spend a lot of – time doing, this is a repetitive annoying task in and of itself, is trying to flip their charts. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we're often trying to shake out a message from our charts, you know, wait a second, this, there we go. As you're trying to shake out, you know, what's the message of my chart, how should I even present this in the first thing, you know, sometimes, so here I have um, some regions, three regions, this is completely all made up, I'll hit shift F5 so you can see this. So I have three regions, and I have quarterly data. Well, if you have pivot tables in Excel, which most of us are like big pivot table geeks and stuff, you know, you get used to wanting to flip your data back and forth. And what most people will do in PowerPoint is if they wanted to flip this from quarters by region to regions by quarters, you know, they would right click, they'd come in, edit data in Excel. Excel would open up. They would, you know, go through all sorts of maneuvers to flip their data around and then kind of look to see if they liked it, all right? And that's kind of standard procedure. That's a repetitive, annoying task, especially if you're doing this lots of charts. But people oftentimes don't realize if I take this chart, I'm just going to control shift, drag it over here to the right. So this is going to be my quarterly view of performance. 
a lot of people, I've seen this before, they come up and they say, hey Taylor, in the Chart Tools Design tab, there's this switch row and column button, but when I click it, it doesn't work. It's grayed out. What's the deal? The deal is Excel has to be open for that button to come into play. If I right click that chart, edit data in Excel, and it's not even going to work, of course. Let's see here. There we go. Open up that Excel, reselect your chart. Notice that switch column row button becomes active. You click it. PowerPoint does the heavy lifting for you. You know, this is goes back to kind of a core concept I like to preach probably too much. It's just if PowerPoint can do it for you, don't do it manually. PowerPoint will do it 10 times better and 10 times faster, and you can move on to the next task. So that's how you open up this switch row and column. That's just a little weird little hack um, that you can use. Um, but let's dive into kind of a more complicated example. Hopefully there's no questions about that. There's not too much more I can say about it. Uh, and I want to look at an advanced charting trick because I know we've got some chart experts on the call. And the one I want to look at is, again, one of my pet peeves that I always look at is getting an automatic calculating total on top of a stacked column chart. All right, does that make sense? And I purposely made this, if I just select these data labels, a little bit off kilter because this is what I've seen a lot of in the banking world when it comes to getting a total on top of a stack column chart. So I've got my company sales, I've got two products, and I want to show a total rolling up across. Now, if you've been in a lot of charts, so first off, a charting shortcut for you. If you select anything within a chart and you hit Control-1 on your keyboard, you are going to pop open that format dialog box specifically to that charting element. Select anything in the chart and hit Control-1, you will, you will immediately jump to its formatting options in that dialog box. You do not need to dig through your formatting options. That's a repetitive, annoying task we want to get rid of too. Okay? So if you come in here, this is just a stacked column chart, notice my label position over here. I really only have center, inside, and in base. There is no put a you know, automate a total on the outside, right? If I click inside base, inside end, inside base, you can see that my um, data label just pops back in. So what someone has done, and I did this on purpose, if I just right click, edit data, edit data in Excel, it's gonna pop open here. I'll try to position this so we can see. So what someone's done is they've taken, right, I only have two data series here, I'll give it a second so it streams through. I've got two data series here, and for 2002, for example, it's 20 and 50, and I've already messed this up on purpose. This was supposed to be 27, all right? So it's supposed to be 2027. Someone's, you know, either got out their calculator or did the Excel calculation down below. It's supposed to be 47 is the total. So they came into PowerPoint, they typed 47, and if I just zoom in, which I have to do in 2016, they did the 47, and then they just kind of, you know, put the data label up on top, right? And I see people do this all the time. What's the problem? Twofold. Number one, you now have to double click in and type the total, which is a totally repetitive, annoying task. The second problem is if I come back to Excel, and let me just wait till the stream's through. So if I come back to Excel, let's say, oops, my number wasn't supposed to be 27, it was supposed to be 57, so I update my data. Notice that the chart on the left updates, but the data label doesn't. It doesn't even stay 100% on top of the, on the stack column chart. So this becomes a huge repetitive annoying task if you let it. So the trick to this is, so that's the trick. How do you get an automated calculating total on top of a stacked column chart? So let's do this. What you're going to do, you're going to come into your data. You're going to type a sum function. You're just going to add these, you're going to add up your, your information. So you're going to add a new data series to your chart. I call this adding a phantom data series to get at other aspects of it. So you know, this is a phantom data series. So if I just come back to PowerPoint, you can see I now have some puke green um, series. Not very attractive. You're just going to right click that series, select add data label. There is your perfect automatic calculating total. It's coming from an Excel spreadsheet, so if the numbers update, they're also going to update. You're going to hit control one. All right, control one pops open the format data labels dialog box, select inside base. It's going to pop down on top, close the dialog. You're then just going to remove, depending on how you, what shortcuts you do, you just remove the fill, you remove the outline, you make it bold, 
All right, I'm not done yet, but you can see that I now have on top of my stacked column chart a total. This product three over here, which is the total, you can select that and just hit delete. Charts are very flexible here in PowerPoint. The only other thing you're going to want to do, because this is all scrunched now, because this data series, it's a floating phantom data series. You can see I can still select it. You're going to want to come to the axes. I'm going to add my vertical axes back. All right, I'll do this slowly. You probably you guys all know how to do this. I'm going to select my axes, hit Control-1. I'm going to set the minimum to zero. And I'm going to set the maximum to match something that's going to fit my chart. So my total here is 455. I might put 550 in. I'll hit tab so it takes. You can see my chart adjusts. I'm just going to delete the vertical axis. And these other data labels, which I need to reset, again, somebody had manually done this. I'm just going to hit delete, right click, add. That will refresh your data labels. You can then use your you know, shortcuts that we talked about to resize your font, control shift, left caret, right caret, maybe make the font white, something like that. So if I hit shift F5, all right, you might want to format some more around this. That is the trick, adding a phantom data series to get an automated calculating total on top of your chart. And as you start to get into more advanced tricks like this, you can create your own snap grids, you can create waterfall charts, which is no longer an issue for 2016 because they added that to the, the program. You can create valuation ranges, all this kind of good stuff. This is like the first level. You can start to rotate things on the secondary axis to create candlestick charts, all this kind of crazy stuff. But that is a great application um, that I always double check people's stacked column charts when I see that kind of stuff. Is there any questions about any of that? Was that too fast? How are we doing, Sharon? We are doing good. We have a lot of questions across multiple topics, but I know it's 11.45. Um, I know we have a couple of things more, but I wanted to at least, um, <laughs> I have a comment I have to share with you. Camille will love this. Taylor, do your friends call you a PowerPoint god? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they should. I'm going to start recommending that. <laughs> I think that's I funny. Friends. I love it. So uh, we have a couple of questions. Let me just go back to um, where it's particularly one of my favorite things is when you were talking about how you can create the charts templates across the different office uh, programs. Mm -hmm. Is there an ability to save it table format in, in PowerPoint as well as a chart? I wish. Uh, tables, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to, what I, what I do, you can do the same if you want. I, I, I keep a slide bank. So like a deck of slides that I like to pull stuff from, and on my slides giblet page where I just put odds and ends, I like to have a pre-formatted chart that I use. So you, if, it's, if it's complicated, and you just kind of copy and paste that chart over with all your preset formatting, because there is currently, unless someone knows of a way, no way to create a default table formatting in PowerPoint. So I will ask some of our experts that are on, if you know of a different way, please feel free to share it and put it into chat. People want to know more about your tips and tricks, so I'm telling people about your course and how they can get access to it, and I've actually put the link in the chat, so if they, if they need it, that would be terrific. Awesome. Yeah, so we have, yeah, there, I put... I put Hold together a free mini series um, on a bunch of strategies and techniques that should blow you away. Um, we're launching it with pre Presentation Expert. I'll, I have a slide at that at the end um, if you want to join that free mini series. Is there a list of what elements are saved in the template versus chart settings that are not captured in the template, like the styles list in the Word or InDesign? So, so the question is, is there a list of what's saved in a chart template? Well, you know how you have like a style sheet almost in Word where it lists, you know, you're going to have the title that looks like here, and heading one looks like this, heading two looks like this. I and see. It's a so. list of stuff. Yes. So like to, so oh, to just basically click a chart and be like, what what formatting adjustments are on this chart? Question mark, and then it would right. spit out exactly. all. Of it. Not that I know of. That would also be very cool. If there's any programmers okay. who make add-ins, that would be an awesome add-in. Absolutely. And then we have another question about is how do you how is this different on a Mac than it is on a PC? That I do not know. I actually don't have a Mac. I I believe okay. it's exactly the same. Um, the only thing that Macs can't do as far as like hacks and tricks is the QAT. There is no QAT on a Mac, and you also can't do the metafile trick. So breaking tables, breaking charts, that's a metafile trick. Uh, you can't do that on a Mac yet. 
Yes. Okay. They're gonna, I'm, sure, I'm sure in the future they'll get that back on there. And Christine is uh, giving us some additional information. She's been great. It sounds like she's really done a lot of this implementation. It's a great awesome. case, case study for this. It, she says, you can choose the default table from the design table styles. You cannot customize one, but you can choose one of the existing ones that at least get close to what you have. Yeah, and let me just throw a table in here really quick. So, yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. If, as far as tables, I mean, this is like an entire conversation to get into table formatting. So what she's saying is you have these default table styles up here. Um, if, if this is brand new to you, let me just make sure you can see what I'm looking at here. Uh, the one thing I recommend is, you know, a lot of people spend time banding and striping their rows manually. You, again, you have a bunch of options here on the left for how your table will um, start out. And absolutely agree, I usually use this light gray standard formatting for my tables to start with and then I just use a bunch of other shortcuts to um, format them so absolutely you can't you can't set this yourself but you can um, get close we have actually have Nolan Hames is on so I want to say welcome to him and he said there there was a there is a customized QAT in Mac 2011 but they removed it in Mac 2016 and he has a sad face so just want to share that with you well, it's, it's, I'm sorry, so they removed the chart template feature in 2016? The customized QAT. Ah. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I know that's one of his favorite tools, so I can oh, see why they have, why he has a sad face. Absolutely. So we want to kind of keep going on here. So um, one of the other things Danielle said, we'll share this and then we'll ask you to continue, is for the tables, if you have a brand branded color palette, that helps to adjust the preset table designs. So just uh, absolutely. Little, uh, our wonderful audience is sharing their own tips and tricks, and it's great. So back yeah, it's great. That's very good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the more you can, yeah, custom palettes using, again, you get, the more you can get PowerPoint to do for you, the better off you're going to be, both in time savings and the better your, your presentations are going to look, especially, uh, especially going to that color palette uh, across all of your slides, which is, you know, consistency is king. It's almost sometimes better than content. Um, <laughs> as I've heard. So we only got a couple minutes left. So I just, another one that I, I see a lot of people struggle with, especially people are moving from Excel, Excel um, models to PowerPoint. We used to do this all the time is how do you create a full cell underline in PowerPoint? This is not a default font style. Um, it's going to come through there. There we go. You can see I'll just hit shift F5. This is an actually native PowerPoint table. Those are full cell underlines for a total. You can have them double spaced. You can have them single spaced. I'll hold control and do my little laser pointer trick. I always think that's cool. Um, so a lot of people, the question is how do you do this without doing all of that space bar return? That's a whole other topic. We're not going to be able to dive into this, but let me just select the table and let me just see if I can zoom in so you can kind of get a feeling for how you do this. Again, there's lots of tricks, hacks, tips for formatting and working with tables quickly, but basically what you're, you're doing here to create this as you're using um, phantom rows and phantom columns to basically create the break because that, ex that accounting style format that a lot of us use for our, our financial models does not carry over. It actually pastes over um, spaces. Does anyone ever had that, those cells that have like a bajillion spaces across them? I guarantee you someone on the call has. Um, if you ever get stuck with that, use the find and replace dialog box, control H on your keyboard, search for two spaces and replace all and you'll nuke all of them immediately. That saved me probably months of my life um, working in uh, finance. So that's totally doable. Again, we don't have time because we're already like back up against the wall with tables. Um, I'm going to just move on one last little trick. I know this is a nuance that some people get messed up with. I call these the three phantom spacing menaces. And what I mean by that, if I come to my next slide, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Here I have three tables, and oftentimes you have a table and you're trying to resize it and it won't collapse on itself, right? And of course, the biggest insult is the table that won't collapse is sitting next to a table that is fully collapsed. Notice that I have twice as much information here in this um, table here in the, in the black box as I have in my other one. So the question is, and I've seen people struggle this is like, where are all this, why, why won't it collapse? What's the issue? So there's three phantom spacing menaces to keep up with. I'm just going to quickly rattle through them. You have interior margins, 
And these are all in different places too. So the first one, if you just right click and hit Z, oh, it's not going to work here. Format shape. You want to come find your interior margins. I have mine set up on my QIT. I'm just going to go there so I can get there faster. Um, so if you have interior margins, those will influence how far you can crunch a table down. The second thing to look at, which is in a completely different place, is your paragraph spacing. So if you come to the Home tab or you just hit Alt-H-P-G on your keyboard, you're going to get a paragraph spacing dialog box that's before and after spacing. will also affect your table's ability to collapse on itself. Um, again, totally different than interior margins. This is the second phantom spacing menace. And the third one is font size, even if there's nothing in your table. So if I come in here, and the way I have these set up is notice that I have this big um, size 24 font size. That is what's stopping me from being able to crunch this. So if, if I create a new table row, let me just see if I can do this really quick. Maybe that'll be easier. Pen colors. I'll just add rows to all this. All right, if I click into my final row here, and let me just zoom in a little bit. I'm doing this on the fly, and I just hit my control shift period shortcut to increase font size. Notice that even though there is nothing in this table row, nothing, deletes, nothing's in there, that table will never collapse below that font size. That catches some people off guard. So when you're getting into creating that Excel file formatting, you need to make sure that you rotate down your font size enough and remove your table margins and remove your paragraph spacing to create that um, accounting style effect. So that is my last trick um, here. So let me just go in just in case. So I mean, this is all still just scratching the surface of what's possible in PowerPoint. Um, hopefully you've gotten some ideas for ways to eliminate some of the rats that you might have you know, learned to live with, uh, or maybe you can start to think about some of the other repetitive annoying tasks you deal with and how to do it. Um, PowerPoint comes down to strategy and technique. It's not about the 1001 buttons. It's when, where, and why to use which buttons to get the deck done yesterday, which is typically when it was due. All right, so this is what I always am talking about. It's the strategies and techniques, and as we said, Previously, if you want to learn a bunch more of these with PrezX, we've launched this Save 40 Hours in PowerPoint for the New Year series. Um, four weird little PowerPoint hacks that work like crazy, and they'll make your slides better too. It's a free mini series. You'll learn a bunch of tips, tricks, and whatever to save 40 hours this year. You'll also be able to learn more about our speed training courses and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested, I think, Sharon, you put that in the... In the chat box, you can also just go to bit.ly forward slash PPT, all capital, 40. That'll take you to this same landing page. You just need to sign up, pop your email in, and you'll get emailed the first video and the other tricks. Yes, we will definitely follow it up, too. We will include the link and the handout. It will be on our website as well. And we do just also make the recording available to you as well, so if you registered and attended, you'll get an automatic link to everything, so you don't have to worry about it. Awesome. We have one question that I know we're running short on time, but we have an a question from Teresa who wants to know, how did you get the laser pointer again? Oh yeah, so in presentation mode, just hold the control key on your keyboard and then click with your mouse. Oh, perfect. That was an easy one. <laughs> Fancy little trick. Fancy also, little trick. If you also hit control I, you can color things. This is your highlighter. This is another fun one that you can color things on your slides. Inking your slides. We did a whole post with PrezX. We did that whole post on inking your slides to That's create right. an interactive whiteboard. So go check out the PrezX blog if you want to learn about how to quickly ink your slides live during a presentation. The cool thing is if you do it, you can actually save the ink to your deck as just a normal object. So you can actually animate it and create kind of a... It almost, you can create an animated effect that makes it look like you're inking your slide. <laughs> well, and Penny, Penny wants to tell you that um, she's going to go look it up, but you can also change the color of your laser pointer, which she learned on Microsoft.com. Um, so cool stuff all around. Yeah, fire away. I'm, I'm happy to stick around. If you've got an annoying task you want my input on, fire away. I've got lots of hacks. <laughs> when saying nice job. Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone for taking the time to join us. I know everyone's busy and joining a long online webinar is not always the easiest thing in the middle of the day.
And what was the highlighter trick again? So that, you just hit I on your keyboard. I on your keyboard. Okay, and we have Claudia wants to know, how can we animate graphs in PowerPoint? Um, so a couple ways. Uh, let me go first off. So I'm, I'm definitely not the animation expert by any means. That would be uh, P Spice. You can go check out her YouTube channel. But first off, for a chart, you do have, once you've like come up to the animations tab, if you throw an animation like fade in, all right, a lot of times people forget that just because you apply a fade animation, you do have these effect options. So you can actually fade in your charts by series, by category, by element in series. So this would be keeping your chart as a chart and um, uh, applying these different animation effects. I mean, you're limited at some level, but at some level, that's probably more than most people need. Another technique, a little bit more complicated, is if you break your charts, so you're basically use PowerPoint to, to build the shapes for you, which again, it's having PowerPoint do something faster than you could ever do it. You then break your chart. You then end up with rectangles. You can then do whatever you want with your rectangles as far as animation. So that's the most flexible. That's also a little more complicated. For most people, if you just add your fade animation or whatever your, your appear or exit animation is, you just toggle your uh, effect options and you're good to go. Okay. I want to thank Thank you, Taylor, for joining us today, and thank everyone. This has just been phenomenal. I keep taking notes. I took even more notes than I did during our dry run. So thank you for all the tips and tricks and hacks and amazing shortcuts, and I know we're going to do this again soon. So awesome. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and watch your email for any links you need. And again, if you have ideas about webinars or stories and you'd like to contact us, you can just go to webinars at presentationexpert.com and that comes direct to me. I want to thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, guys.